My history can be like your policy. The Speaker of the House became a powerful office back in 1889 when a past Speaker denied congressmen of a sacred right they cherished the right to become invisible. It used to be that members of the House of Representatives held a secret power. They could show up to the Capitol building, take their seats, say hello to their fellow members, and chat it up. But when the Speaker of the House called on them and asked if they were present, they could simply not answer. By refusing to vote yes or no on a motion, the minority could ensure that a quorum would not be achieved, and without a quorum, the resulting vote would be invalid. By this single action, they could stop the giant body that is the House of Representatives from running. It could be used to block all sorts of legislation and make the opposing party, the one that was in government, look very bad. And overall, they could be a pain in the rear until they got something they wanted, perhaps something for their district. That ended with Speaker Thomas Reed, a bold and boisterous man with a passion for his own brand of partisan Republican politics. He was known for strong wit. When asked if his party might nominate him for president, Speaker Reed noted they could do worse and probably will. And he had no qualms about using his gavel. When he made his quorum call, he began counting every member present in the chamber, whether they chose to answer the roll call or not. Reed's intent was simple to enable his Republican majority to make decisions that the minority could not block by parliamentary maneuver. They needed to vote it down or vote it up. Now, a point of order would be raised, and there'd be a little bit of an argument, but the Congress overall agreed with Speaker Reed. Not surprising, because it was a majority Republican Congress. Through these and other rulings, Reed, who would then become known as Czar Reed to the Democrats, ensured that the Democrats would not block the Republican agenda. Speaker Reed did more to shape the functioning of Congress than anyone had up to that date. And his motto, government works best when one party governs and the other one watches, has survived several party switches and is basically the system that we have today. With its esoteric rules and mechanics, the House of Representatives is at once the center of the world democracy, the model of government by and for the people and at the same time, the most undemocratic place on earth, a place where most ideas are dead if they don't have the support of a few people out of several hundred. And in the center of this contrasting reality is the Speaker of the House, sometimes grand, above the politics, and sometimes partisan. The recent events regarding former Congressman Mark Foley and the emails have put attention on Speaker Dennis Hastert, a man for which there has not been much attention put on in some time. A low man, former wrestling coach, and a consensus builder within the Republican ranks, who took office on January 6, 1999, leaping over several other prominent Republicans in the wake of the resignation of Speaker Newt Gingrich. A man who this June became the longest-serving consecutive Speaker, though it's unlikely he will ever match Sam Rayburn's 18 unconsecutive years. But what is the office that Speaker Hastert holds and the power that he has? The Speaker of the House is a uniquely American office. It's unlike its counterpart in most of the parliamentary democracies which the American system was based on. Parliamentary speakers simply provide voice to the parliamentary body. The American Speaker, in many ways, is the body. It is a changing office, one that has been held by men that saw the position as neutral observer and timekeeper, all-powerful dealmaker, noble leader of the people's government, and a partisan leader. Many speakers who have held the office saw it as all of those at once. What is pretty clear is that the Speaker of the House, as it's largely been through Modern American history is not what the Founding Fathers intended. They created a system of checks and balances in which the balance of the power of the President, this executive that in many ways they feared, would be matched by a House elected by the people. They could not have anticipated 
that this power of the people would be so consolidated in the hands of a few people, committee chairs, and that there would be one individual who is almost an executive within the legislative body. Constitutionally speaking, the Speaker of the House is a walking aberration of the Constitution. Not that that document says much about the Speaker. Article 1 of the United States Constitution provides, The House of Representatives shall choose their Speaker and other officers. And that's it. That's all that we the people, that's all that the Constitution have to say about the Speaker. We don't even require that the person be a member of the House. Though to this date, no non-House member has ever served as Speaker. The rest of the Speaker's entire job has been set by some arcane rules written by Thomas Jefferson, which have been followed and not followed at different times, but mostly have been established by precedent and bold grabs for power, such as Reed's. But we do know what the Founding Fathers were thinking of when they thought of a Speaker, and that is the British Speaker of Parliament. The British Speaker, which they were basing the model on, is to this day a neutral figure, above the fray, recognizing members to speak and shouting at those who don't behave regardless of their party. And although the Speaker in the British Parliament is often selected from the governing majority, it's not always the case. And speakers do represent a district. They are members of parliament, but they often do not campaign. And it's only recently that they're even opposed for election when they run. This is in sharp contrast to the American speaker who, while observing some ritual customs of the House, serves in many cases as the leader of his party, speaks out on legislation, and stands for re-election and is strongly opposed as Tom Foley found out when he was defeated in 1994 while sitting as a Speaker of the House. And two Speakers in history have been defeated in such a way. In fact, the American Speaker of the House actually does very little of what people think he does. They think he stands atop the chamber, recognizes other representatives to speak, and holds his gavel. But that function, day to day, is mostly delegated to other members. Dennis Hastert and his modern counterparts would be spending most of their times in meetings, in caucuses. His greatest power is not his gavel, but his selections. The Speaker appoints nine of of the 13 members of the powerful Committee on Rules. And that committee determines how debates will happen in the House, which is really everything. Furthermore, the Speaker appoints all members of select committees and conference committees. And if you remember back to your social studies, how a bill becomes a law, the House votes for a bill, the Senate votes for a bill, and then they go to conference. And the conference obviously isn't the whole bodies, but it's committees within the bodies. Speakers choosing who's going to go in there and fight for the House versions of the bill that's going to be turned into law. And you can bet that the Speaker has a huge influence on how that legislation is shaped. When a bill is introduced, the Speaker determines which committee shall consider it. These are incredible powers to determine the debate before the debate. Okay, let's look at some historic speakers and see how the office has shaped and this tug of war between partisanship and nobility has existed over time. The first speaker was Augustus Conrad Mullenberg. He's an American minister a Lutheran pastor by trade, and a delegate representative from Pennsylvania. His German-American heritage gives evidence to the influence of that immigrant minority at this point, the 1790s in early America. But while Mullenberg held a prestigious post in being speaker, he didn't really hold a powerful one. He simply ran Congress, made sure members were heard fairly. Some of this starts to change in the early 1800s with Henry Clay of Kentucky. In contrast with his predecessors, Clay took the unusual step for being a speaker of participating in several debates, and he used his influence in office to procure passage of measures that he supported. Most famously, the Declaration of the War of 1812. When no candidate received an electoral college majority in the 1824 presidential election, 
Speaker Clay threw his support to John Quincy Adams over the popular vote winner, Andrew Jackson, thereby ensuring John Quincy Adams' victory. This later raised serious suspicions when Henry Clay was named Secretary of State by Adams. Still, Clay mostly ruled from his own personal integrity and influence, and not from dominating rules. And his actions were mostly done for the purpose of advancing the national interest as he saw it, and not so much for partisan benefit. The next change in the speakership begins to happen with the aforementioned Thomas Reed, the famous Czar Reed. He served from 1889 to 1891, then with a small Democratic interruption, he served again, from 1895 to 1899. He would get into some trouble when there would be war fever in Congress for war with Spain. Reed opposed it and ended up retiring in 1900. But the speakership would really reach its zenith in 1903 during the term of Republican Joseph Gurney Cannon, known as Uncle Joe Cannon, exercised extraordinary control over the legislative process. He determined the agenda of the House he appointed members to all committees, chose committee chairman, rules committee himself, and determined which committee heard each bill. He vigorously used his powers to ensure that the proposals of the Republican Party were passed by the House. Uncle Joe, as he was called, because he was never without his cigar or his friendly demeanor, rarely spoke harsh words in public. But silently, he ruled the House like a tyrant. He recognized whomever he wished. And he clashed famously with fellow Republican Theodore Roosevelt, blocking many of his progressive proposals, calling them unconstitutional. Eventually, he would face pressures from progressive Republicans, and in 1910, George W. Norris, a Republican congressman from Nebraska and a progressive, led a revolt against him using parliamentary procedures, and building a coalition of progressive Republicans and minority Democrats, he stripped Speaker Cannon of much of his power. Now, this is a famous event in political history and the history of the Congress, and it's well known in the famous, you know, revolt of the progressives against Speaker Cannon. But what is interesting to note is that the reforms that Norris proposed in 1910 did not completely go through. He wanted a rules committee that was set upon a regional basis. So there would be, based on what state you were from and a rotating system, would determine who got on the rules committee, rather than the speaker's choice. The Democrats who Norris needed in his revolt against Speaker Cannon were not so fond of that idea. Though they wanted to break da- bring down Speaker Cannon, they didn't want to go as far as Norris, because they felt that soon... They would have the speakership and didn't want to give up all that power. They would agree to increasing the size of the Rules Committee from 5 to 10 and removing the speaker from the committee. But to this day, the Rules Committee, the all-important committee of the House, and nucleus of legislation, is still controlled by the speaker with the approval of the majority. In 1920, Nicholas Longworth took over as speaker And without any revision of the rules, he completely recovered the power of the speakership. In a way, Longworth was just as autocratic in his control as Reed or Cannon had been, but he did it in a more tactful, nicer way. And he did it with some bipartisan support. Longworth reached across the aisle to Democrats and forged a productive relationship with John Nance Gardner, who was the uh, minority leader. And in fact, they would have regular... Board of Education meetings featuring bourbon and cards in the uh, in the back chambers in which both parties would get to talk and work out differences. Longworth used his coalition uh, with Democrats to ignore the left progressive wing of the Republican Party, which did exist in the early part of the 20th century, and he passed legislation that aimed for balanced budgets, major tax reductions, and resisted any new programs that would expand the role of government. He would lose his speakership when Republicans lost their House majority in the post-Great Depression election of 1930. Sam Rayburn was a legendary for his honesty and integrity, despised lobbyists and did not accept anything from them. He only said, I am not for sale, and walked away. In his years in Congress, 
Rayburn, who was very quiet about his private life, always insisted on paying his own expenses. When he died, his personal savings only totaled 10000 Most of his holdings were his family ranch. Rayburn was generally well-liked and not a very partisan figure. Of course, most of the time of his speakership, Democrats had comfortable majorities. Beginning with the election of 1978, a new generation of younger, more conservative, and more confrontational Republicans came to the House determined to bring to the House a Republican majority. Their leader was Newt Gingrich, congressman from Georgia. During the 80s, Gingrich and his allies in the Conservative Opportunity Society sought every opportunity to challenge the Democrats, their policies, and their leaders, and their management of the House. The Republicans' goal was to turn seats held by the Democrats into seats held by Republicans, period. This Republican onslaught, in sharp contrast to Nicholas Longworth's Board of Education meetings with Republicans and Democrats, or Sam Rayburn's gentle, bipartisan ways, forced the Democrats to take defensive measures in both the legislative and electoral processes. Legislatively, the Democrats sought to use their majorities to control the House agenda in order to prevent the Republicans from forcing floor votes on politically inspired amendments, something that Gingrich was trying to do to get the Democrats to take position. This greatly enhanced the role of the Speaker in the Rules Committee as agents of party governance. Electorally, the Democrats sought to strengthen their fundraising capacity, candidate recruitment, and electoral strategy. Starting with Speaker Tip O'Neill, speakers became increasingly engaged in electoral activities. The activities were not confined to a campaign season, but instead extended through the calendar year with planning for the next election beginning as soon as the current election was over. When Tip O'Neill resigned the speakership in 1987 and Speaker Jim Wright took the gavel, he engaged in a much more aggressive style of campaigning. He also took a very aggressive approach to the Reagan administration. And an extremely bold move that drew the ire of Republicans in the Reagan administration when representatives from the Nicaraguan government came to the United States, they met in the, in the Speaker's office before going to the State Department. A very bold move for a Speaker of the House, where the President, and not the Congress, is supposed to be in charge of foreign policy. Speaker Wright relished in fundraising and never missed an opportunity to go to a member's district, either before and when he became Speaker. For this and other reasons, he became a, a big target of the Republicans, particularly New Gingrich, and eventually... Uh, caught up in some ethics charges involving a book that uh, he had written and lobbyist purchase of that book, he was forced to resign. The story would almost be repeated when Newt Gingrich, the, the very congressman who had brought Speaker Wright down, had his own ethics violation involving his own book when he became Speaker and in 1996 had to uh, accept a censure from the House. Throughout history, Speakers of the House have not been well-known people. A testament to this is that only one, James Polk, ever made it to the presidency. It was said that Sam Rayburn could walk down most streets, even in Washington, D.C., and not be recognized. James Blaine was a Speaker of the House and ran for president, but was defeated. Reed and Cannon were both well-known public figures and appeared in newspapers and cartoons at the time, but in both cases, the public image did not lead to good results for their party. About the only exception to this is Tip O'Neill. O'Neill became the nation's leading elected Democrat and therefore the primary opponent of President Ronald Reagan. Republicans ran campaign advertisements against him in 1982, but to no avail. Speaker O'Neill's public approval ratings exceeded those of Ronald Reagan when he left office. To this day, He's the only Speaker of the House to have appeared in TV commercials, at least to my knowledge. Part of that might have been explained by Tip O'Neill's gregarious personality, which really came out on TV, and that because he was the subject of Republican attacks in 1982, he did get some sympathy support. In strong contrast to O'Neill, Newt Gingrich, flush with power, assumed a very public role one of the most public roles of a speaker ever, probably since Joe Cannon, 
when he took over Congress in 1995. But taking that public role involved a gamble. And when President Clinton won a square off with congressional Republicans over the government shutdowns of late 1995 and early 1996, and when he, during his presidential re-election campaign, associated Gingrich with reactionary policies to great effect, it was clear that Gingrich's gamble in taking on the image of the entire Republican Party and the opposition to President Clinton had failed. Although Gingrich would continue for a few years as uh, Speaker, his power was somewhat curtailed. Legislation preventing another government shutdown was proposed by members without his knowledge. There was a coup attempt in 1997, which was almost successful. And then in 1998, in the wake of uh, unprecedented uh, midterm election defeat for the Republicans, he was forced to resign. Another note about the Speaker of the House, and this is that the Speaker of the House has a relatively new role historically speaking. An act of 1947 made by statute the Speaker second in line to the presidency. Speaker John McCormick in the early 1960s and Speaker Carl Albert in the 1970s were at one point first in line to the presidency during a period of, in Lyndon Johnson's term and in Richard Nixon's term and Gerald Ford's terms respectively when they had no vice president. Part of the reason that the Speaker of the House, rather than the Secretary of State, is the second in line to the presidency may be because Truman enjoyed such a good relationship with Sam Rayburn, and Sam Rayburn had been so different to presidents with whom he served. He was very tight with Roosevelt and Truman, and also with President Eisenhower. It's not clear at all that such legislation would pass today. Let's summarize a bit here. So we know that the Speaker of the House is a uniquely American and very important player in our American system of government. He and just a few people that make up the majority leadership really control the House. So 435 members are represented by truly as, as few as 13, of which the Speaker has far the most influence. Throughout history... The speakership has rotated a bit between the noble, neutral gavel keeper and the partisan leader. Though increasingly the trend in modern times, given modern fundraising and close house elections that we've had in the last uh, quarter of the 20th century and now, increasingly we've moved more towards the speaker as the top partisan leader. The speaker's powers are not understood by most Americans. And speakers of the House generally are not well known. And historically speaking, when they are, it's usually not a good result for their party. Dennis Hastert, as the current speaker, has been able to keep a low-key role. His new prominence, given the Foley scandal, may not turn out very good for Republicans. The speaker of the House the next term, whether it's Hastert, whether it's another Republican, whether it's a Democrat, should seek to move the office more from its current partisan leanings, to more of the Henry Clay, to more of the Sam Rayburn, even the Nicholas Longworth, a true speaker for the whole house and a builder of consensus. With History Beating Up Politics, I'm Bruce Carlson.